Hello, everyone. This is the Trifecta Sports Podcast. Back at it with another episode. Uh, today, we got the NBA draft. We've got a lot of other different crap to talk to you about. I'm Frank. This is Coop and Dave. Uh, we're going to start it off. I want to give a shout out to the Ole Miss Rebels college baseball team. Last per, last, uh, last team in the, in, the, in the NCAA tournament for baseball. Something funny? Y'all laughing at me? Yeah. Coop's got a Minnesota... <laughs> Coop's got a Minnesota Wild hat on, and I just noticed. I, that's the first thing I noticed. What the hell Time is that? Wild. That's the first thing I noticed, too, honestly, when I got on here. I'm committed, boys. I've watched five games. I'm a Wild fan. Krill the I, thrill. We, oh, Coop's been converted, yeah. Bills. But anyway, shout out to the Ole Miss Rebels. Coach Mike Bianco winning the College World Series. They were the last team to make it into the NCAA tournament. Um, barely it got beat out in the first round of the SEC tournament, barely made it in, ended up winning the whole damn thing. So, uh, shout out to the Rebs, uh, SEC team. Another ones that I picked, I did say it was an SEC team that's going to win, but I thought it was going to be Arkansas or Tennessee, but it is what it is. But, uh, College World Series, electric atmosphere. Um, but other than that, we're going to get started. Uh, so the NBA draft, fellas, uh, what are some, uh, initial thoughts? So, we obviously had. Paolo Bencaro from Duke going number one overall. And then Chet Holmgren, number two. And then Jabari Smith followed up with number three. Um, first question I want to ask you guys is, which one of those three do you think is going to have the best overall career? I know I'm putting you on the spot. We haven't talked about this. Everything on today's show is going to be winged. We didn't write anything down. We usually have a script or something, but I think it's going to be better if we just talk. Because we had a YouTube comment that said we were boring and that the guy listened to us when we, he went, when he went to sleep. So, um, <laughs> shout out, shout out to that guy. Uh, a lot of people ASMR. do not. Yeah. Was, they, our voices are so soothing and they put you to sleep, man. And I'm yeah. not going to lie. There's certain videos I'd like to watch certain, um, certain channels that I watch that, I, that, you know, puts me right to sleep too, but, uh, shout out to that guy. So, uh, maybe we won't be so boring for you if, uh, we just wing it. So we're winging it like an eagle. Yep. So we just had the NBA draft wrap up and, uh, Paolo Bencaro from Duke went first overall, and then we had Chet Holmgren followed up with uh, Jabari Smith. So, really quick, my question to you guys is, which one of those guys do you think is going to have the best overall career in the NBA? I'm going Chet. I think the people who are on the front end of the movement in the league are going to have a better career, and I think it's getting more athletic, it's getting more skilled, it's getting longer at the skilled positions. So you bring somebody in seven foot that basically, you know, has a guard skill set and the way he can still play defense because defense is kind of becoming popular. You're having some guys that are really good defensive players that are staples on these teams that are winning championships. Um, those are my favorite guys to watch. You got Marcus Smart, defensive player of the year, Draymond Green. I mean, those are two featured players that were just in the NBA finals for their teams. I don't know if Chet has that level of grit or if he can get there because both those guys are pretty physical and he's got a really thin frame. But what he can do, uh, he he can literally do everything on a basketball court and he's seven foot tall. So I got to go with Hungry. I'm, I'm going to take Paulo. Um, and I got a couple reasons for that. First off, the rumors are that Chet tanked his uh, draft uh, pre-workout with the magic and if there's any truth to that karma is going to come in and bite him in the ass and then we also got history on the side of paulo bancaro the magic i read an article don't fact check me just believe me what i say take it it's 100 percent correct right if it's coming from days <laughs> it is so true the magic have not missed they've had four number one overall picks and they have not missed we're talking about Shaquille O'Neal, Chris Webber, that they then traded for Penny Hardaway. Still good. And As a player, third, not a coach. Yep. And third, Vince Carter. Now fourth, Paolo Bancaro. Did So they had three number one overall picks before this, and they pretty much had four Hall of Famers, including Chris Was Carter. Dwight Howard, did he go one overall? I guess not. You're the one that did the research. He wasn't on the list, so I guess not. But he was a good. I, that good doesn't ring well. a bell. Nope, he didn't. He sure <laughs> didn't. He sure didn't. Don't go back and check it. 
right. So uh, in my head, I had Jabari Smith saying that I, I was going to say Jabari Smith is going to have the best overall career, which is funny wow. because we all picked three different people. I'll say my argument for Jabari Smith is he's so well-rounded in a sense that he was the dude on his team the whole year. Now you can say Paolo and Chet, they were, they were still dudes, but they didn't, they didn't have the ball in their hands all the time. They looked for Jabari Smith. Bruce Pearl basically built an offense around him. The other coaches, they didn't build their offense around those other two guys. Now they may have more talent overall, but I think athleticism wise, like you guys said it, both all three of these guys are super athletic, but I don't know that Chet Holmgren's going to be physically ready to step up anytime soon. Over a long period of time, he might be, he might blossom into a really good player like Giannis did. Uh, but I think Jabari Smith is already there. Uh, I think Bancaro is already there as well. Uh, I just don't know if if they're in good enough situations right now to to have it, you know, in the next five years when your rookie contract runs out, if you're going to get another max deal right away. I think Jabari Smith is the guy that can. Um, is there any guys in the draft that you think are steals? Like right out the gate, they stole them. Late rounders, uh, you know, somebody that fell late in the lottery, something like that. Any ideas? I mean, the one that kills me to say, but I hope he's a steal at seven, is Shaden Sharp. I'm talking about a kid who's going from his junior year of high school, skip to senior year, sat on the bench at Kentucky for three months, and, you know, was a high lottery pick. And people – we're saying that if he were to go back to Kentucky next year, he was, he was, we're talking one, yeah. one. So if he is, if he is as advertised, I would say Portland got a hell of a steal at seven, you know, but we'll see. We'll time will tell with him. Yeah. I'm going to go. Avi at, yeah. Jaden Avi at five. Got to, a lot that, of people. I was going to pick honestly, maybe the best prospect in the draft. Like he's, He's ready to play. He has that explosion. He plays both ways. A lot of comps, most often to Ja Morant. I mean, I had I was really high on Purdue all season. I had him in our March Madness bracket. You know, that's who my pick was to win it all, and he was a big part of that because he can attack at the NBA level and defend. And I think getting him at five because he refused to work out for Sacramento, <laughs> which, you know, that's kind of that Chet Holmgren thing you're talking about. Maybe Karma comes back and gets him but he also comes in as a guard and doesn't have the responsibility of being the guy. You know, he's playing alongside Cade Cunningham, who had a great rookie season, you know, in a team that's struggling. But I feel like Detroit had a really good draft. They're young. They're definitely not a this-year team. But I think that Ivy could be really good down the road. I like I like the, what, what Detroit, had, Detroit and the Rockets did with their draft. Um, Detroit also went out today actually and helped the Knicks clear up some cap space uh, by trading uh, Nerland's Noel and another player, I forget his name to Detroit because Alec Burks, I think. Yeah, that's his name. Uh, and then the Knicks are going to go after Jalen Brunson, but uh, I'm going to be a homer here and pick Tata Washington all the way down at number 29 to the Rockets, you know, sticking with the Rockets theme here, you know, they went out and got, um, Jabari Smith was the third pick, and then Ty Ty fell all the way down to 29 to the Rockets. Not sure why he fell so far. Uh, I have a feeling that a lot of it had to do with him playing hurt the last half of the year, not really putting up the numbers that, you know, somebody might think. He looked a little slower. He was banged up. Uh, the Rockets didn't actually draft him. He was traded. The, the pick was traded to Houston, but the Rockets got him. So a 29th pick of the draft. But I, I think that's it's really low. It's a good value there at, at the bottom half. Um, another couple undrafted. Uh, I know Scotty Pippen Jr. went undrafted, signed a two-way contract. I feel like that dude should have been drafted. He, he was the definition to put a team on your back uh, at Mandy. I, I think that's one that sticks out to my mind that kind of fell out that shouldn't have. Um, I don't know if you guys have any more names out there that Brady you think. Manic. That's another one, too. Captain Caveman. Yeah, he signed with the Hornets summer league team, but that doesn't mean an NBA contract. You know, he's still yeah, got a ways to go. But, uh, you know, he was going to be my honorable mention for still the draft. He just didn't get drafted. Um, <laughs> he's got the tools. I mean, he's a stretch four. He's shown he can 
above average shot blocker, especially for a guy that shows no athleticism until he goes to block the shot. <laughs> like you watch him play and there's not, it doesn't look smooth unless he's shooting the ball. Like he doesn't look that athletic, but he's pulling down eight, nine rebounds a game. Uh, I think he led that team in blocks. So can really be a steal for somebody with the way the NBA is transitioning to the perimeter game. Uh, watch out for Brady Manick. Yeah, I'm always a, a big fan of those undrafted guys. I really want to see him do well. Uh, Scotty Pippen was a guy that, that stood out in my mind. Uh, I do think that it would have been really cool if he stayed in school, transferred, maybe a grad transfer, got into the year at, at a place like Kentucky. Uh, just, you know, being that guy, saying that. But um, it could have helped his draft stock a little bit. I don't think draft stock was a thing to him. So he's going to get a chance in the summer league. He's going to blow up. I, I feel he's going to be in, on an NBA roster, maybe not this year, but in very few years to come. He's going to be on the NBA roster. I just, the dude's too good of a scorer not to. And if you can put the ball in the basket, that's really what the NBA is about nowadays. From all areas of the court, I think he's a guy that, that you got to put in that conversation. Is the NBA still about putting the ball in the basket? So that's a great, I want to talk about this with the finals wrapping up. The Warriors, the team that has, you know, borderline changed the league with Steph and yeah. Clay and the Splash Bros and all this three-point shooting and stretching the floor and small ball, they won that title with defense, like 100%, right? Wiggins made Tatum disappear. You got Draymond, who is perennially in that defensive player of the year conversation. Guy averages 12, 8, and 5, and he's probably a first ballot Hall of Famer. Like, how many people can you say that about? So I don't know. I know the draft still definitely leans pretty much all – offense and scoring but is the league still is that what it is is it still get buckets get playing it, time it is in my opinion because it the league is about it that doesn't necessarily make championship teams about it we all know that in order to win an nba championship the only time you actually play defense is in the, in the finals or in the playoffs at all that's really the only time you see them like working hard defensively um which makes it even better uh, and, and if I mean, I understand them not wanting to really do it the whole season long because you can see the scores of the games. They're in the 130s. They're in the 140s all the time. Hardly ever do you watch an NBA game that's stuck in the 80s or 90s. Somebody's scoring 100 every night. So in my opinion, it's about scoring. And if you can't put the ball in the basket, if you don't have four or five guys scoring 20 a game, you're not winning. So that, that's my opinion. Yeah, and just watching the NBA, you know, you, you look at the the Celtics. Whenever they played, a lot of it was, you know, ISO with either Jason Tatum or um, Jalen Brown. I'm blanking on uh, Jalen Brown. Can't dribble Jalen yeah. Brown. And I, right, and I think, I think the smart teams know how to defend that. And you know, Jason Tatum tried to, you know, be Kobe Bryant and. He's not Kobe Bryant. He's Jason Tatum. And, you know, it was his first final, so you give him a little bit of a leash. He wasn't he wasn't as good as he was in the Eastern Conference finals. You know, he got locked down on good defense. And we've talked about it before. Everybody in the NBA can make an open jump shot. That is why everyone is there. And they are the elite athletes in the room. It's can you play defense? Can you – can you stick to a game plan to make the other team make mistakes? And that's why the Warriors were still in dynasty talk, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I don't think it's slowing down anytime soon. They're always going to be in the conversation now. They might have a year where you know injuries hurt them a little bit uh, the last couple of years when they weren't in the conversation. But it as long as that, that core group of guys are there who, in my I, – I don't watch NBA. I don't really care about it. But I do like the fact that the Warriors aren't going out other than Kevin Durant. They're not going out and buying championships. You see what I'm saying? People are like, oh, they're loaded. They're a stacked team. They're like, but they drafted a lot of those guys that are there. Just because they draft good, you don't have to hate on them because they get one or two pieces. You know, you add one player in there that's a super yeah. team. And this year, Jordan yeah. Poole went off. Wiggins had a career year. But the, the core three of guys are, are draftees. Guys that that organization picked. Uh, yeah. But 
I'd even say even more than that. I mean, Pool and um, is it Wiseman? Uh, who's their? He didn't big play guy? at all. Yeah, James Wiseman. He got hurt. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they've got they've got five or six guys that they drafted that are in you know their own yeah. guys. Kaminga you don't see them could still be moves. one of the best players in the league as he develops. Yeah, you don't see him making a lot of moves. You did see him go get Kevin Durant a couple years ago, and that was you know they took the whole world by storm there. But I think that I would gave still, them... I would still say that the Warriors got Kevin Durant a championship instead of Kevin Durant getting the Warriors a championship. I would agree because he's that not too. done it on his own. He and everybody nothing. on that team has without he's one of the he's he's a top three player in the world, but he's not done anything. He's been with the Nets, garbage. I mean, it's a it's still a garbage situation up there. The whole Kyrie deal. I, I think he did uh, take his option. I think he's going to be a net next year. But who knows what the hell that's going to be. I mean, who knows? I don't know. I don't even like NBA enough to tell you what the deal is there. And I could care less. I just know that <laughs> a lot of the times you have some spoiled spoiled babies making decisions or trying to make money in the NBA. And I'm 100% okay with it. I, I was listening to Busting with the Boys podcast with uh, – who was on there? I can't remember who it was, but he was talking about the NFL and he said, you're, if you're good enough for a short, you're only good enough for a short period of time. So during that short period of time, you have to be selfish and make as much money as you possibly can because your athletic ability in that span is, is, is all you got. It could be over at a heartbeat. So that's why these guys are doing this is because they really never know. Like you look what happened to John wall got traded to the Clippers or side with the Clippers, uh, Got paid a lot of money to to opt out of his contract, but what I mean, you haven't heard anything from him since he came into the league. Hardly ever. He's has he made an All Star game? He's not played in two whole seasons. He made forty seven million dollars last year. That's what I'm saying. You can't blame <laughs> a guy like that. Yeah, he's he's playing the game right. Don't hate the player, hate the game right. So, um, that those are that's why that's why those guys you see do, are doing that, and people like us are sitting here thinking. These selfish bastards, you know, I would pay for a million dollars a year. I would sit the bench for fifty five hundred thousand dollars a year. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You would right now, yeah, because you suck at everything you do. <laughs> that you're not good enough to do anything that these guys are doing to get paid for it. But like, if you're in that situation with that athletic ability and that skill, you're not settling. That's why these guys are there and you're sitting on the couch eating Cheetos, commenting on our YouTube videos saying we suck. But uh there's that. So, next topic. What's it going to be? Uh, we got some changes in the college landscape. ACC today decided to eliminate divisions. So, I think this is something that we're going to see kind of growing across college athletics. Uh, primarily, football is where the conflict was, but I think it's going to expand past that. You're getting these conferences with so many teams and because of the way divisions are structured and the way the schedule, the scheduling model works, it's affecting their ability for postseason play. You know, these teams are getting locked in to eight, nine, ten conference games a year and they can't get that out of conference strength of schedule that they need to get into the college football playoff or to get into the NCAA tournament in basketball. So the ACC is the first, you know, conference to do this, and they've eliminated those divisions. So I haven't. I think there was another looked. conference. There was another conference out west that did it first. I'm not did sure they? what it is. Pac-12 talking about somebody it. did it. Let me go ahead, Coop. I'm looking up real quick. I don't think they have the exact scheduling model picked yet, but it's going to give them more freedom to play for the top teams to play more top teams across the country. You know, that's what it really comes down to. Um, especially in these mid-major conferences where they're locked into competition with subpar teams throughout the season. Like, they can't build that resume. Um, aside from, like we've said on here, the SEC breaking off and making their own league or the ACC breaking off and making their own, you know, leaving the NCAA, I think this is the only way that you're going to get some of those teams a fair shake when it comes to postseason play. So I love the move. I think it's it's good. It's taking the right step and – uh. Hopefully, it can keep all these conferences playing together under that NCAA. I don't want to call it a banner because that makes it sound like it's a good thing. But, you know, 
network that they have. So, yeah. So, did they ditch the championship game? I don't believe so. There will still be a conference tournament. They just don't have in season division play. Because I I feel like what we're going to end up seeing here with the ACC, you're going to see like Clemson, Florida State, and you know, let's throw North Carolina in there. They're all sitting there at eleven and one in football season. And now the ACC is going to you know make a huge push to say we we need two two to three bids depending on who wins the championship and who's who's on the outskirts looking in at that championship game. Yeah, I think you what know. the conferences are doing in the Pac-12, Dave had it right, is the other conference that have already made the switch. And I'm reading an article here from ESPN, and it says um, they're, they're not doing away with championship games. So the, um, the commissioner of the Pac-12 says our goal is to place our two best teams in our Pac-12 football championship game, which we believe will provide our conference with the best opportunity to optimize college football playoff invitation invitations and ultimately win a national championship. So these conferences are actually playing the game against the game here. So the college football playoff committee sets their standards. A lot of the times it has to do with conference champions. Sometimes it doesn't. So what these people are doing is they're doing away with divisions so they can go out and you know build a resume better. Uh, they, they're not required to play, or they—I don't think they're required to play a certain amount of games in their conference. If I'm not mistaken, I haven't looked at it in depth, but I would say they have the the freedom to basically play who they want to to build their resume. But it's an—they say it's an important step towards that goal. It immediately increases both fan interest, which I agree with, and the media value of our football championship game. So basically, you're looking at like you know when Texas and Oklahoma enter the SEC, can you imagine when that split happens? So let's say the SEC decides to do away with divisions. What that was going to do to the world of football? Like, think about that for a second. You're going to have teams like Auburn go out and schedule these Big Ten teams, these SEC teams. Let's say Auburn is, you know, if they play SEC schedule fully without a required number of games, where they would probably go seven and three or something like that. If they get to go out and schedule their own teams, let's say they schedule a Notre Dame, they schedule a, a, a UCLA, they go up north and do Northwestern, who was always in a bowl game. They go to Penn State, they go to Michigan, and they beat all those teams. And now you're looking at Auburn, who would be seven and three normally in the SEC West. Now in a conference championship talk, or let's say maybe even a college football playoff berth talk. And they didn't really play who they would normally play. So that's what's going to happen. And I think what this is going to do is it's ultimately going to push the college football playoff committee to expand to eight teams. I think that's the only option that you can have. Expand. Because once you have teams yeah. not having divisions and being forced to play these schedules, then they can make their own schedules. You're going to have too many teams to pick from that are going to have good resumes. And it's just going to be another big argument. I hate the college football playoff. I don't it's know. It's the dumbest like... thing in sports. You're just you're just making money by adding a bowl game. That's all you're doing. You're adding one extra game. So you can call it a national championship, which we had before, right? Different bowls. Traditionally just one or two were the national championship. And now you're just you're monetizing it when there's no real change. It's not including any more teams. Like, uh, it's dumb. Expanding it to eight eight teams from four, like, it, you can't have a playoff in college football. The season's too short. You're still, you still have kids. These are student athletes. You can't put them through 15, 16-game seasons because you want to expand your playoff for money. The FBS does it, and they do it well. They've been doing it for years. You have North Dakota State winning national championships all the time. Samford. Those types of schools, those lower tier two or division, they're not division, they're division one still, but they're on the lower level. That's where you get your Eastern Kentuckys, um, your Murray States, your your teams like that who are in these smaller conferences. They go and play in these, this, this it's tournament at the end of the year. Um, I think the Jackrabbits of, was it South Dakota State? I don't know who won it this past year, but James Madison is another school that's, you know, always in the, in the, in the final few games of that tournament. They play a, like a seven or eight 
game schedule. They have their conferences. And then I don't know how they get berths into. They have at-large berths. They have conference championship berths. It's kind of like basketball. They have a full playoff. Like I think it's like 16 teams. And they play playoffs, just like a high school. Why can't you do that? Have divisions. Break up the D1. Instead of everybody being in the same pool, have 130 schools. Break them up into further divisions. Have more. I'm not saying give everybody a fucking trophy. I'm just saying have more people they're ready to go maybe break it in half you know you have your your power five and then everybody else yeah but you're talking about conferences having to get conferences to give up millions of dollars for those you know that texas a&m and alabama game but that's going to happen whenever you get rid of divisions well they're they're going to keep those key rivalries they're not all gone you're not going to see Auburn, Alabama disappear. You're not going to see Ohio State, Michigan. Like even if those conferences get a, get rid of divisions, like those games are going to happen. There is a rivalry in the ACC. It's not a big one, obviously. It's Wake Forest and somebody else. I want to say it's like NC State. The, after splitting the divisions and not having anybody there, not playing, they're not going to play a game for the first time in a hundred years. They're not going to be scheduled because of the division, the no division thing. See, that's that's where that's gonna that's what's gonna happen is some of these games aren't going to get played. And I mean, you take a, a, a hundred year old historical rivalry game and just not play it one year, like how crappy is that? Yeah, but <laughs> look at it. I'm looking at. I'm saying NC State's probably looking at Wake Forest is like, hey man, you suck. We can't get anywhere because you're a terrible team. We just beat the crap out yeah. of you. And, you know, that's what they're trying to promote here is strength of schedule. And North, I'm going to say, I'm going to say NC State's look, chopping their lips. I shouldn't. Wake Forest is actually pretty good. Wake Forest is just licking their lips saying, hey, we just lost a bad game for us and we can go pick up uh, somebody else. I don't know who else is not in the not region, but. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see what's going to happen for sure. My issue is that you can't. Football is a different animal. You've got a hundred kids on a college football team, right? You can dress sixty-three or something for road games. You have a hundred kids, maybe more, on the practice field. You have that many bodies to go through. You have that many scholarships you've given. Basketball, baseball, not the same. Not even marginally close in roster size and the talent pool don't, that you've recruited. Don't get me started on baseball scholarships. But what I'm getting at is like college world series, you can have an Ole Miss come from last four in to last team standing in March madness. You can have uh St. Peter's come from a 16 seed into the elite eight. You're not going to have that in football. There is no benefit to matching up a, I know James Madison's one double A or whatever, but there's no reason for them to play Alabama. It yeah. makes no sense. If you expand like when, this playoff to sixteen thirty two teams, it your first round games are buys, right? Because football yeah. there's so many people on the field, there's so much talent. That's why you see the same teams up there year after year, because that's where the talent is going. And when you get the top you get 300 out of the top 500 kids to go to four or five schools. That's who's going to be playing for the title. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. I guess we'll see what happens. I do like the regular season marquee matchups that we're going to get these primetime games that, you know, you're going to have to have like, you know, flipping through the channels back and forth, watching every one of them because, the scheduling of the TV deals and whatever is going to happen with that is going to be an issue. Uh, getting, you know, who's the primetime guy, uh, you know, everybody's going to be watching this on a, on a Thursday night or a, or a Sunday night or a Saturday night. It doesn't matter, but it is going to be interesting to see whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. Uh, it's still up in the air for me, but like yeah. the death, the death of the NCAA. I think, started. I think you're right. Honestly, because you're thinking about like, I'm, re- I'm still reading this article and it says, you know, the SEC is going to have 16 teams when Texas and Oklahoma get in here. And think about it. Texas, Oklahoma, 
Texas A&M, Alabama, Auburn. On the east, you got uh, Florida, Tennessee, you got Georgia. Georgia. That's it. Uh, so, most years. Yeah. Recently, it's been Georgia. <laughs> For Kentucky's sake, do not get rid of Bandy. <laughs> no, nah, that's the thing that I don't want to happen. We need that. We need to play Vandy every year. Give we, me Vandy. We, we we just want we just want the East. We just want to win the, the East. We just want to get need. to Atlanta. We just want to let us play for an SEC championship. Let's sniff one and see what happens. Yeah, let's get blown out by Bama by 30. We're there. It's okay, but we can say we, we made, made it. it. We're there. But anyway, I don't know if the SEC can get rid of divisions, honestly, because of the marquee matchups that it forces those teams in the West to actually have. But you have the scheduling power to have those. Auburn, Alabama is never yeah. going away, ever. You will but never Texas get A&M that and, and Alabama no. is is getting to the point. I'm not saying it's, it's not the same. Iron Bowl is an Iron Bowl, but like right now in today's time, especially after the comments, you know, Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban battling back and forth, that game is going to be more watched than the Auburn Alabama game, just simply because of what's happening today with the NIL and stuff. So you yeah. may lose a game like that. That may not happen. I don't think. I think. I think those schools are too smart, and they know too much money's on the line to give up those but spots. You would think, but you don't. We don't know. The broadcast is too smart too. I mean, it's the same reason LeBron plays the Cavs on Christmas Day. It's not a coincidence. Right. That's the game they want. You know, people are going to tune into. That's what draws the attention. I just. I don't know. I think the playoffs are dumb. I like that they're getting rid of divisions, but those. Those matchups, they're going to keep them. They can say what they want about scheduling, but those main games are going to stay. Well, and here's my question. What about all of the, you know, preseason games where, you know, Alabama is paying Eastern Michigan $3 million to make the trip down to get their shit kicked in? Are those games now gone? Because that tells a lot of programs pay for their – you know, an athletic budget for the year is, you know, sending their 60 kids down there to get their ass kicked on a Well, they Saturday won't be going to Alabama anymore. They'll be coming to, you know, Kentucky, Cincinnati. Probably be a good one. Um, yeah, but is Cincinnati going to throw them that kind of money that they that they used to get? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I just think there's, there's de- deeper cuts in this than what people probably think about. There, yeah, there, Cause like, there's some of these things that I've not thought about That's a, until you guys brought them up. Is Division it, One too big? Is that the problem? That, that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. it's so oh, big. It's too big. 100, 100%. That's why you need to have two separate divisions. I know we do already, but you got a hundred and whoever teams on one. There's so many teams out there. Like, Power Five should be their own Division One. That's it. Everything else should be in the tier below well, it. And we we've done on our our little rant about NIL, but Power Five kids aren't college athletes. They are professionals. <laughs> yeah, the, Nine, they are ninety percent of play. them are. A lot of Power Five kids exactly. just go there to say that they played Division One Power Five football. Then they're going to transfer. Well, right. But that's where the talent difference. Like Coop said it, Coop nailed it. Expanding is not going to change anything. Cincinnati, I'll tip my cap to you. I'm glad you made it last year. But you were good, but you weren't that yeah, good. Go play Ohio State. You, you weren't in that elite level. Exactly. And But like, but you go look at like basketball. I mean, hell, I I was at a D1 school. I was at a D2 school. I was at a junior college. I've seen literally it all. And it is different. There is just different levels, and a hundred percent D one is too big, and it's just getting bigger because of all this conference realignment. Yeah, so I, I honestly don't know where to go from there. From here, actually, um, I, I don't think that. I mean, we could sit and talk about this all day, and not yeah. get anywhere because we just don't know what's going to happen. This is all speculation at this point. But if you have an idea, throw us an idea. What do you think is going to happen? Leave it in the comments below. Real quick on NIL. Yeah, the uh, Getting my my weekly North Carolina nod in here. 
Armando Bacot did an interview this week telling how much he has got in NIL deals since he said he was coming back to Carolina, and it is north of $500,000. He is making over half a million dollars to come back and play this season in NIL money. That ain't bad. Good yeah. for him. Better than being on a G League bus. Yep. Fels, you got anything else? I think we need to touch on the whole Freddie Freeman situation. Oh, yeah. uh, are you guys caught up so with this? Here, here's so what I've gathered. I'm gonna say, David, I'm gonna, I, I mean, I see it on Twitter. I see him sitting in the dugout. Dave just standing. got straight hijacked. He had his topic. Yeah. He was ready to throw it out there. And Frank said, I'm the host. Executive no. producer pulling rank. <laughs> He he asked. Get he said, "Listen, hey, you guys heard about that." And all I'm you listeners you what out I've there, heard. all you listeners out there, you think Frank's got it together? Frank's the one giving you the information. Those are my scripts, word for word. Every bit of research I put out, Frank's just stealing it. And now he's trying to scoop in an off the dome topic from Dave. I was answering a question. <laughs> Dave said, oh. "Have you guys heard about that?" And I was going to say, the only thing I've heard about is that he's not happy with the Dodgers. I will shut up now. All right. To recap, Dodgers and the Braves played this last weekend. It was Freddie's return to Atlanta. Long awaited. He got his ring. They did it up big for him. Freddie came home. Atlanta's favorite son. And it was a weird weekend where Freddie Freeman cried about six times between at the start of each game, between every at bat, you know, the fans gave him a lot of love. Um, You even had it, uh, Clayton Kershaw come out and say, I hope we're not the second fiddle right now, which boom, drops the mic. Freddie Freeman goes out and fires his agent that brokered his deal to the Dodgers. And then uh, Freddie then came out and said why, which that this is the crazy part to me. Basically, his agent, who was brokering the deal with the Braves, said, here is the number. Uh, I can't remember how much, but we're going to say it was like $160 million for how four years. You have an hour to respond. The Braves will say, well, we're not, we can't do that. We don't have the cap, the cap room. Clearly, if you have it, if you gave me an hour, there he is a deal on the table he's going to accept. And in fact, you know that's when we see the Braves go out and get Matt Olson, basically say we love Freddie, but he's no longer on the team. Now you fast forward, he f- signs with the Dodgers, and if you do the math, he actually signed for le- for less money with the Dodgers than what the Braves would have given him if you do the California versus George taxes. So Freddie wanted to go back to the Braves and his agent screwed him over and he got the can. Can I speak now? Just Freddie. (laughs) Go for it. Floor is yours. That's unfortunate. Uh, Okay. I'm done. My, yeah, it's, it's really weird, really weird situation. I think, the emotion that he showed at the ring ceremony, like just what are you doing, Freddie? Like, I know it meant a lot to you, but I, it doesn't make sense to me that it was about money. And then the way he looked on the field, it didn't seem like it was about emotion. So if I'm, I'm right there with Kershaw, like, why, why are you here? I don't understand everything that it, that I've seen from you looks like you still want to be in Atlanta and how much money has Freddie Freeman made already. And if he had comparable deals, why, why did he leave? Like there's something we're missing, something that we don't know, but yeah, he's having a great year, right? I think his like last seven, eight games, he's hitting over 400. He's hitting over 300 for the year. Like he's still definitely a talented player. So I don't know what's going on. It's it's like he bro- it's like he broke up with his girlfriend, but he's like, man, she got real hot in the last few months, and he wants to go back to her. <laughs> like, and and the Braves are like one of the hottest teams in baseball right now too, and that's the thing they're doing it without him. That's probably making him feel just as bad. Well, 
Seattle. Exactly. Like freaking year too. And that's like, uh, I saw somebody say today, it's like, well, do the Braves trade for him? Or do the Dodgers trade him back? And it's like, I, I think that ship has sailed. I mean, I think the Braves, they might miss him, but they've got a replacement that's younger. And it's going to do the same thing for a longer period of time. Yeah. Well, Phyllis, I'm oh, out of topics. What do you guys got? This, I don't understand this with – when you're making that much money, I just don't – I can't wrap my head around how 168 and 158 is that big of a difference when you're talking in millions. I've been in the league for six, seven years. I've already got – tens of millions of dollars in the bank. I've got the mansion. I've got the cars. Why? I don't get that. Like these people holding out for max contracts. NFL makes a little bit more sense. Cause like you said earlier, Frank, like those careers are extremely limited. You can lose your career on a single play. It's much less likely to happen in these other sports. And you see it time and time again. And it sounds like, like they've just said, it came down to a contract dispute with an hour to respond. Like it blows my mind how that happens. Like, is it? it I don't happen. think it's greed. I don't think these players are that greedy. There's just something I'm not grasping in why you have to have that little it's extra. The agent. The agent has ruined it for everyone. Anytime, because they they get the one percent, and that one yeah. percent matters to them. That's that extra ten million dollars. So that's an extra hundred thousand for them. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's quick math, we'll see more. Yeah, uh, accounting, right? You know, back in the day, Dave over here is a CPA. He should have had me. He should have had me beat. <laughs> I, I already had it in my mind. You just have a quicker, quicker. Uh, I don't, I'm offended by that. I, you caught me off guard. <laughs> 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 I had a thought, and that cut deep. So. Oh, Lamar Jackson. Do you think we're going to see more of that? More players and moms representing themselves in their contract negotiations? I think that's awesome. Yeah. I think it, uh, yeah. if I was a parent, it just depends on how educated I was. I would, I, I'm hopefully I would be educated enough if my child, my, one of my children were able to, you know, have a, a career athletically that they would need an agent for, whether it be golf, you know, gymnastics, whatever it may be. That's what my two kids love both of those sports. But I would hope that I would be educated enough to make an educational decision, be like, hey, I can, I know enough to help you. I don't want these outside people. And I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for you. When in reality, these other outside agencies are doing it for them. If they want, they're being selfish for it. That's why they, they want to get all the best athletes because they can get the most money out of them. I don't know. I think two of the, two of the best examples are – you could arguably say the two greatest black athletes ever in Tiger Woods and Serena Williams. Both of their fathers, you know, they were right there through their entire upbringing when, and they brokered a lot of their first deals and their first contracts. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think the, the map is already there. It's just, um, I think now, especially where, you know, youth sports are so, you know, they're exploding all over America. I think you'll probably see more parents that are like, you don't need representation. We got yep. you. We don't know that yeah. I would shout trust a lot of parents. Hey, shout out to Mrs. Lamar, though. Mrs. Lamar Jackson, his mom, a black woman representing him. Like, that's great. Get rid of the agent. Let her step up. No middleman. Him. I'm sure he's heavily involved, but I know she was a big part of his rookie deal, which is why I'm mentioning her because she's the only thing close to an agent that's ever been yeah. mentioned. But, uh, yeah, I love it. And I love his attitude going through the negotiations. Like, we'll get it done. It's not a big deal. I'm still showing up. I'm still doing stuff. Don't worry about it. Like, and they ask him if he wanted to be a Raven the rest of his Mom. career. He's like, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. He has no problems. Mama. Mama Jackson's just taking that contract with a fine comb. <laughs> she ain't going to miss a thing. Yep. That's a note to all That's your parents out there. Too. Quit worrying about getting your kid transferred to the right high school. 
quit worrying about what AAU team they're playing on in the summer and just let them play ball and then help them make the right decisions after they get an opportunity to continue playing. Yeah. Well, if I, if, if I, if you see me on TV next to, next to Rich Paul at the next game, you'll know that I've made it, fellas. A Knicks game? That's made it to you? (laughs) At the Garden? It's Madison Square Garden, dude. Everybody goes to Knicks games. Nah. Going out with Spike. Me and Spike Lee. I'm going to go. What a good time that would be. I'd just take his glasses and put them on see what happens. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) All right, fellas. Uh, We're going to wrap up the show if y'all don't have anything else. No, I was going to throw out a random topic. We don't have to hit it. We'll, we'll table it. We'll, well, what is it? You know, you threw out the garden. What's the best venue in sports? Wimbledon? Augusta? Oh, my God. I'm Wimbledon? not saying. Listen to me. Wimbledon. I'm the best I'm doing venue obs- in the sports Shut world. up. Listen. <laughs> I'm doing obscure sports. Not obscure, but like ones that don't think about. Iconic. We're looking at Wimbledon, Augusta, St. Andrews. Talking about golf over there in Europe. We're looking at um, the O. Was it the O2 Arena in London? It's where they play rugby over Uh there. Mm. Then we also got. I did play rugby. You played rugby not in there. London? No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> played all over the South, but not overseas. Uh, gotcha. But you also got, let's say, basketball. You had the Staples Center. Madison Square Garden. You got the Dean Baseball. Dome at Chapel Thrill. Crypto Center. Cameron Indoor, Rep Arena. You got Fenway, Wrigley, Yankee Stadium. You've got Lambeau Field. Oh, Lambo's good. That's probably the list. I, you don't think Lambo's? I would, up there? I, 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 so I would put Dodger most, Stadium in there too. So you're saying most iconic sports? I mean, venue. the most iconic is coming from the list I just named. Can you maybe name another United, one? That maybe the United Center, because no, the I don't even know what that is. House, Chicago. It's a house that Jordan built. It's got a statue in front of it. Doesn't matter. If I don't know where it is, it ain't iconic. I just can't. I don't know about the garden, man. The, New York has just been so bad for so long now. They can be bad. That's fine. But when you, it's Madison Square Garden. The history of it is just, it's there. For me, personally, it's like Wrigley Field. The Cubs have sucked, but Wrigley's one of the most iconic baseball fields of all time. The Cubs won a World Series in like the last 10 years, and they didn't win the, one. The hundred years prior, <laughs> I understand that. So yeah, blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. Hell, the Reds have won a few. I'm a no. new one. <laughs> They've had three. They've had three stadiums, and, they, and 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 haven't done anything since. Yeah. So personally, for me, it's the Dean Dome. I want to. I got to go see a game in you Chapel said, Hill. You're, That's just me. I'm not even going to say Reds. Why? Yeah, because Rep Arena's not... What is that? Shut up. Rep Arena's awesome, you know it. It's a Coliseum. I'd take Fenway. Fenway's up there fin- for sure. Fenway's got to be up there. Uh, I just think that a baseball field has to be in the top three. I would probably have to put Fenway up there because it's iconic. Like, you got Yankee Stadium. It's the, the monster, big green monster. Penske it's all that. It's, it's the scoreboard where, the, you know, it's all that stuff, man. It's probably the best baseball field. I would love to go there one day. Um, <laughs> Quick story. Hi, Jack. My brother. You guys don't know my brother. Anyway, um, my brother is a quadriplegic. He's in a wheelchair, okay? He's six foot four. He is pasty white, and he weighs about 130 <laughs> pounds. He went to Fenway Park one time with cornrows. Went to a game at Fenway Park with some friends of his. Had cornrows put in before he went. Can so you got this pasty white guy in a wheelchair strolling in. 
to Fenway with cornrows. That's an iconic sports moment for you. <laughs> That's so funny. I can imagine Shane doing that. That's awesome. Yeah. Can we get a picture of that? I'll see if that? there's one out there. There's got to be. Uh, yeah. That's before Facebook, though, I'm sure. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> so Fenway is probably at the – it would have to be one of the top three, if not. I think you got to put Augusta in there as well. You know, I do agree just, with that. But I mean, Wimbledon is a big deal to people. It ain't a big deal to me. It's a big deal to the wrong people. It's a people. big deal. I'm not a tennis guy. My wife watches tennis. But it's a big deal. And there's What's a the lot of soccer stadium. The, like Wim, is saying, it Wembley? A, we, Wembley Stadium, yeah. That that's yeah. what I was trying to think of. It wasn't the O two stadium. I know they play rugby there. But Wembley is a big one. I know there was a couple yeah. around the world that I wasn't thinking of. I know New Zealand like I'm a rugby guy. I played rugby. So I've watched a lot of rugby and to watch it really competitively, which now they got a lot of, they have leagues in America now, which are really good. But New Zealand and Australia are really, really, really big in that sport. And New Zealand, the All Blacks, they play in the in I think it's Canterbury Stadium or something, something like that in Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm gonna look at it up real quick. That is iconic. Um just to see those guys and, and, and just they fill it up. It's like it's crazy. But you know, that's one of the other big time stadiums or sports venues of all time. But it, I mean it's not to us because we don't ever see it. But I would put Fenway probably at the top of my list. Did we lose Coop? No, nope, I'm still here. Uh, what about the uh, Field of Dreams that they just built? Not yet. MLB's playing games on it. Still not there yet. It's not a Fenway. I mean, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. If the tickets weren't three thousand dollars, I would I would yeah. go. But it's still a, a baseball field in Iowa. <laughs> Good point. All right, guys. Uh, we're going to wrap up today's show with Fenway Park being my favorite. It might not be your favorite. Uh, if it's not your favorite, you know, drop a comment below and tell us what your favorite sports venue of all time is. Um, appreciate you guys listening. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, share the video with your friends. Appreciate it. Love you. Peace.